I'm still the oldest person, male or female, to even go to the Olympic Games in my event. My diet was the most powerful aspect to me being able to perform and produce for the U.S. team at the Olympic Games. All of these athletes and their stories were impressive, but my goal from the beginning was to recover from actual injuries, like the damage I'd done to my knees. Chinese down at the line of scrimmage in the arms of Derek Morgan. Derek Morgan had been on a similar journey. In the NFL, the injury rate is 100%. It's a violent game. Hit hard and goes down there. And so how you respond to injury and how quickly you heal from injury is important because if you're not on the field, you're not helping the team. I was reading the research and seeing that a plant-based diet could be beneficial specifically for recovery. And so I started incorporating it and I started seeing really good results with it. I was recovering better. I wasn't getting as sore. I was a lot less swollen. Basically to confirm what I was feeling, I got my blood tested. Six months after being on the diet, all of my markers were down, my blood pressure, my cholesterol. But the main thing I was looking at was the inflammation marker in your, in your blood, and mine was almost obsolete. It wasn't there anymore. A whole food plant-based diet is going to optimize the growth of blood vessels into damaged tissue. It's going to lay down new tissue in tendons and muscles. It's going to stimulate their immune system to fight off infections. So almost at every level, eating the right foods is going to accelerate the healing process. Six weeks into my personal plant-based experiment, I went to the gym to see if I could notice a difference. I wasn't able to spar or wrestle yet, so I decided to hit the battling ropes. At my gym, lasting 10 minutes on the ropes gets your name on the wall. Only a few people had ever hit 20 minutes. Even at the peak of my conditioning, the most I'd ever got was eight minutes. James, keep it going. But on this day, I hit 10 minutes easily. Then I hit 20. 30. You're at 45 minutes. I thought, holy shit, I'm gonna do an hour. I went past the hour mark by about one minute and just thought, all right, that'll do. I can't believe you just did that, man. The only thing that had changed was my diet. I could have kept going. That's <laughs> yeah, the record, right? Yeah. Freaking hour. When I was growing up, the toughest guy in the world to me was my dad. He taught me the value of self-defense and was always there to help me when I got into trouble. But now, he was the one who needed help. Well, you had a heart attack. Correct. Had you had much in the way of symptoms prior to this episode? No, never before. The first... After my dad got out of the hospital following emergency heart surgery, we got on a Skype call with Dr. Coldwell Esselstyn, an internationally renowned heart disease researcher from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, always been, I think, very fit. So somewhat of a surprise. Well, no, not a surprise. In all of Western civilization, there is nothing more common than coronary artery heart disease. And that is because of the foods that most people eat every day. Do you happen to recall into which of your arteries did they place the stent? Was it into the left anterior descending or the right? After seeing how much a single animal-based meal can affect healthy young athletes, I couldn't help but wonder what a lifetime of these foods might have done to my father's heart. In all of our studies, we found the same thing. These same biological mechanisms that affect performance also affect our health. Chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, and endothelial function. When you eat animal products, you start to form plaques in the coronary arteries plaque formation in the arteries doesn't just limit the function of the arteries. It can also block the blood flow, and that's when the heart starts to have some real problems keeping up with the demands of the body. In terms of heart disease, oftentimes there's confusion. People think that, well, I don't eat red meat, so I'm OK. We know that it's more complicated than that. It's not just red meat. It's not just the fat. For nearly 50 years, we were told that the primary cause of heart disease was saturated fat and cholesterol, and that leaner meats, lower-fat dairy products, and egg whites were the solution. 
But the research now shows that the other inflammatory compounds in animal foods, like those that can impair athletic recovery, also play a significant role in the development of heart disease. We're going to do a whole lot better by just getting rid of the animal products. And there are really good biochemical reasons for that. Heme iron is one of them, for example. Heme iron is from an animal source, right? So uh, most commonly you think red meat, even though poultry have it, fish has it. They did a meta-analysis looking over six prospective dietary studies, over 130,000 patients. And they came to the conclusion that one milligram a day of heme iron is associated with a 27% increasing risk of coronary heart disease. To put that in perspective, an average hamburger patty has about two to three milligrams. And it isn't just the iron in animal foods that can cause problems. It's actually the animal protein itself. It's not just red meat, not just chicken, not just eggs, not just milk. It's the ingestion of any animal protein. At that moment in time, a process begins at a chemical level inside the body. When the protein found in animal foods is cooked, preserved, or even just digested by our gut bacteria, highly inflammatory compounds are formed that corrode our cardiovascular system. This helps explain why people who get all of their protein from plants reduce their risk of heart disease by 55%. It would also help explain why the only diet that has ever been shown to actually reverse heart disease is a plant-based one. What we found is that in the first month, there was improvement in blood flow, and the heart began to pump blood more normally. After a year, even severely clogged coronary arteries became measurably less clogged, and even more improvement after five years. But in the randomized control group, who were doing just what their doctors told them to do at the time, you know, less red meat, more fish and chicken, little exercise, and so on, their arteries got more clogged after one year, and even more clogged after five years. While all of this sounded promising, my dad didn't just need to get better, he needed to get better fast. The stents in his heart were only a temporary solution. He could have another heart attack at any moment. I found some hope at a firehouse in Brooklyn, where Dr. Esselstyn's son Rip, a former firefighter and professional triathlete, was launching some of New York's bravest on a powerful new program. What's the number one killer of firefighters in the line of duty? heart attacks. 67% of firefighters who perish from the line of duty die of heart attacks. So this right here, that is what we call a healthy artery. The blood can flow through this huge opening here. And this is what happens after decades on the meat and dairy diet. Okay? If you guys have been eating this way, I want you to take the seven day rescue challenge. We bought you guys plant-based groceries. I want you to give yourselves the chance to see what your internal biochemistry does in just seven days. My, my cholesterol is elevated. My LDLs are always very high. The same job that I was doing like 10 years ago without an effort, yeah. without taking an effort. Despite working out all week, playing sports, my cholesterol is high and growing by about 10, 15 points every year for the last five or six years. I realized a couple salads a week, it doesn't really cut it. We got two kids, you know, so uh, hopefully I'll feel better, have more energy, and uh, add some years to my life. I went to see if I could get my dad to make these same changes to his diet as soon as possible. Well, what are you suggesting? Well, let's do the shopping. Tomatoes, Back. cucumber, we have hummus dips. But my dad can be a little stubborn. Soya yogurt, that's about it, I think. So I wasn't feeling that hopeful. We're just drink tea. I come from a town called Melton Mowbray, known in England as the rural capital of food. It's the home of Stilton cheese and the world famous Melton Mowbray pork pie. The pace of change here is very slow. And my dad, like most of us, is a product of where he grew up. I just couldn't imagine someone as set in his ways as my father, making such a big switch. Until I got home and went back to the gym. I've spent years working out with Lucia Smith. 
He was a cornerback in the NFL, has a black belt in jiu-jitsu, and was my strength and conditioning coach. That's it, that's it, that's it. Arms, arms. I told Lou about the research I'd been doing and what happened to my dad. And he'd never mentioned this before, and he said, I've been on a plant-based diet for almost 10 years. Lou is 60 years old, not far off my father's age. Most guys my age can't keep up with the grandchildren. My grandchildren can't keep up with me. When I went from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet, my blood pressure went down to like 110 over 70. My heart rate sometimes has been under 50, like 48, 47. I'm more focused, I'm more relaxed, and I notice that I have a lot more energy because of the plant-based diet. Come on, come on, man, come on, come on, come on. People in their 20s, they come in here. We do a workout. I sustain the workout a lot easier than they do. We can come in here and do 800. Listen to what I just said. 800 kettlebell swings and snatches in one workout. They can't make it. I'm not kidding you. They can't hang, man, I'm telling you. They can't hang. There was another guy my dad's age who had also made a big change. I ate a lot of meat. I ate my 10, 15 eggs a day. And, uh, you know, I had my 250 grams of protein a day because I weighed 250 pounds. One and only Arnold Schwarzenegger. But as I got older and as I started reading up on it, I recognized the fact that you really don't have to get your protein from meat or from animals, as far as that goes. So we started going more in the direction of the vegetarian kind of a diet. Now with doing it the right way, with the right spices, all of a sudden, I love it much more than the meat. And, uh, you know, the cholesterol went down to around 109. It was the lowest that it ever was in my entire life at almost 69. What we eat has a major impact on our health and our well-being in every way we can measure. People who eat a diet that's high in animal protein have a 75% increased risk of premature death from all causes and a four to 500% increased risk of death from most forms of cancer, prostate, breast, colon cancer, as well as type two diabetes. The amino acids that come from animal sources tend to make our cells rev up and multiply faster. For example, there is accumulating evidence that high consumption of proteins from dairy sources is related to a higher risk of prostate cancer that chain of cancer causation actually seems pretty clear. Cancer has been linked to other animal foods as well. Research funded by the National Cancer Institute found that vegetarians who add one or more servings per week of white meat like chicken or fish more than triple their risk of colon cancer. So it's not one set of dietary guidelines for improving your performance as an athlete, another one for reversing heart disease, a different one for reversing diabetes, a different one for reversing prostate cancer. It's the same for all of them. As groundbreaking as all of this nutritional science was, I also found it really confusing. How could meat be so bad for us if that's what our ancestors were supposedly built to eat? When we think about the diet of early humans, we're often drawn to thinking about meat, but plant foods were more important than the archeological record gives credit for. The food that could be relied on wherever you were was the plant food. The popular perception of what early humans ate dates back to the 1930s and 1940s when there was some amazing finds of early human ancestors, animal bones and tools that very much looked like they may have been used to butcher and maim those animals. So very early on, we had this notion that meat had a disproportionately larger role in the diet of early human ancestors than it actually did. The bias in the archaeological record toward stone and bone preservation over things like plants has led to a very skewed view. If we look at deep time, bones and stone tools preserve very well, but plants decay very rapidly. What's exciting, though, is in the last decade, we've started to realize microscopic fossils of plants do preserve quite well. And so we're revisiting some of these earlier Paleolithic sites and finding abundant evidence of plants. Advanced technologies, like those used to analyze the gladiator bones, have allowed scientists to take a closer look at the tools, bones, and teeth of our ancestors, leading to the discovery that early humans ate mostly plants. 
And the reason for this is actually quite simple. Humans do not have any specialized genetic, anatomical, or physiological adaptations to meat consumption. By contrast, we have many adaptations to plant consumption. We have longer digestive tracts than do carnivores, and this allows humans to digest plants and fibers that require longer processing time. We also lack the ability to produce our own vitamin C. Vitamin C is found in plants, so the fact that we cannot make our own indicates just how reliant upon plants we actually are. This is why we have trichromatic vision. This is very different from carnivores, which have dichromatic vision. We can see more colors, and this is very important, especially if you need to find fresh, ripe fruit. We have a brain that just is desperate for glucose. It's a, I mean, it's such a fussy organ. That's the only thing it really takes in for energy. Well, meat's not a very good source of glucose. To have a big brain like this, you need to eat something different. And the most efficient way to get glucose is to eat carbohydrates. But what about our teeth? Aren't they proof that we're built to eat meat? In primates, you might think canine teeth are associated with a diet of meat, but they're not. In gorillas, when males want to intimidate other males, they will show the length of their formidable canines. On the other hand, carnivores have distinctive teeth, and they're shaped like scissor blades. They simply shred the meat off and they swallow. Compare that to the teeth of a human being, square and low cusp for crushing and grinding tough plant tissues. Right there in your own mouth is the best evidence we have for a diet that could not have been meat. If you just got placed in some ancestral environment, the best thing you could be equipped with is not a very sharp spear. The most important thing you could be equipped with is knowledge of which plants you can eat. Suddenly it all made sense. The reason an animal-based diet isn't good for us is because our bodies aren't built for it. It's simply the wrong type of fuel. The only thing that didn't really fit was B12, an important vitamin that everyone kept warning me you could only get from animal foods. It turns out that B12 isn't made by animals after all. It's made by bacteria that these animals consume in the soil and water. Just like with protein, animals are only the middlemen. Before industrial farming, farm animals and humans could get B12 by eating traces of dirt on plant foods or by drinking water from rivers or streams. But now, because pesticides, antibiotics, and chlorine kill the bacteria that produce this vitamin, even farm animals have to be given B12 supplements. And up to 39% of people tested, including meat eaters, are low in B12. As a result, the best way for humans to get enough B12, whether they eat animal foods or not, is simply to take a supplement. When I caught up with Scott a full month into his 2200 mile trek, he had fallen well behind record pace. Not even a week into the journey, I developed a quadricep tear. I had to start thinking, okay, how am I going to get through this? There are no rest days when you're setting a speed record on the Appalachian Trail. I needed to recover while I was still pushing my body to the brink waking up the next day and the next day after that and doing the same thing. I really had to trust in my training and trust in my nutrition to help me get up each morning at 4.30 and put another 50 miles in. With only 12 days left to break the record, Scott still had 550 miles left to go. They were experiencing record rainfall in Vermont when I went through, and there's just no way that I could be prepared for it. I was trying to make up all the ground that I'd lost with the injury, trying to get back on record pace, getting two to three hours of sleep or less, night after night after night, going over some of the most remote stretches. I put in 26 hours straight, but the Appalachian Trail keeps throwing more and more mountains at you. It never really lets up. And by the time I actually got to New Hampshire, the White Mountains just obliterated me. With less than two weeks remaining, Patrick continued training for his world record attempt to carry more weight than anyone in history. I started lifting weights when I was 14 years old because I was kind of wimpy and, and small in that time. 
And I wanted to be some kind of hero, able to help if something happened. This is my mom and dad. When I was four years old, my dad, my mom, and my little sister, she was six months old, they were in a car accident. And only my mom survived the accident. So when I was young, I had these fantasies of uh, being super strong. And if someone got trapped, being able to help them get out. For any guy watching that day, it wasn't just a car Patrick had crushed. It was a myth they'd been fed their entire lives. Steak. That's what a man eats. Made from stuff guys need. Eat like a man, man. There is no one that can relate to that better than I do because I've lived in that world. Steak is for man. Go me! They showed us commercials, burgers, George Foreman with the grill. Yeah. And the big sandwiches and all that stuff. Eat like a man and be full like a man. This is great, great marketing by the meat industry. Serious man food. Selling that idea that real men eat meat. You look like more of a man with a quarter pounder in your hand. But you got to understand, that's marketing. That's not based on reality. Okay, I'm going to take you down to the exam room. When I think of a manly man, I think of somebody who has strength, endurance, sexual prowess, and fertility. And in fact, what the scientific studies are showing is that the more meat men eat, the more quickly they lose their manly manhood. The blood test with the Miami Dolphins measured how a single meal could affect blood flow throughout the entire body. I asked Dr. Spitz if he could conduct an experiment with three collegiate athletes, but this time on a more specific part of the male anatomy. So, <laughs> here's a model of a penis. Dr. Spitz is the lead delegate of urology for the American Medical Association. When it comes to the penis, he literally wrote the book. Now, you're going to be putting this device on yourself. One ring goes on the base of the penis, and the other ring goes on at the tip of the penis, just behind the head of the penis, but knows how tight to squeeze to know when an erection is starting, because when it squeezes, it'll determine, oh, it's now of a larger circumference. Something's happening. What we're going to look at is what effect the meal you have has on your erections that night, and you're going to be eating two different kinds of meals. Yeah. For this study, on the first night, we gave the guys burritos that had meat, beef, chicken, pork, but really high-quality meats, grass-fed, organic. On the second night, we gave them very similar burritos, but we swapped out the animal portions for plant-based protein. That's really good. I thought this was going to be nasty, I'm not going to lie. I didn't think we were going to get a burrito. I thought we were going to get a salad. <laughs> <laughs> this study is going to take advantage of a natural function that occurs in men when they sleep. Men's bodies create erections. And this occurs throughout the night while the subject is asleep. And once an erection happens, this device can sense it, and a printout is generated of how firm the erection was, how long it lasted, and how many of them there were, to see if we can see a physical effect on erections as a result of what they just ate for dinner. This is where we uh, take a look at the results. So Mason, I'm going to give you your results first. Let you take those out. OK. The bigger the circumference, the harder the erection. And so you'll notice that that first circle, which is the, the meat meal, is not as big a circle, it's not as hard an erection as that second circle, the vegan meal. Now let's look at the second sheet. The second sheet is a, a accumulation of how many erections and for how long you had over the course of the night. So that first stubby graph <laughs> Is really, it's not the oh, size of your dear. penis. <laughs> I'm struggling. It's not the size of your penis. It's how, how many minutes throughout the night you had erection. Wow. 
Blake, let's take a look at your results. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hold composure. And look, again, yeah. like Mason, uh, you were more erect after the plant-based diet than the meat-based diet. Okay, how about how often you had erections? Oh. Wow. <laughs> 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 That's almost a 500% difference. Dang, man. That's crazy. Blake, you ready for yours? You All questions. right, here you go. <laughs> You had about a 13% change in the hardness of your erections. Okay, let's look at how many or how long you had erections <laughs> for. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Show it, dang it. Yeah, don't hold out. Oh. <laughs> bro, that's an hour, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys all had a very similar response to the meat meal versus the plant meal. That's crazy. Yeah, growing up, if I saw some big dude at a restaurant eating a big old steak, and so I'm like, oh, I, I need to be like that. And then like I see like a guy ordering a salad off the menu, I'm like, he saw it, right? Yeah, I'm like, oh, that guy, <laughs> what is he, he doing? It. But really, at yeah. the end of the night, the guy eating the big steak is soft, and then the other guy is, is, is a heart. <laughs> so, when you take your date out on Valentine's Day, where are you going to take them to eat? To the veggie grill. So okay, oh, the yeah. veggie grill. <laughs> now, this is not a scientifically validated study, but the results that we're seeing are very exciting. I think this is going to wake a lot of people up. I think it's going to wake up people who have penises, and I think it's going to wake up people who like people who have penises. While all this talk about erections was interesting, it also made me wonder about hormones, specifically testosterone. I've never eaten a piece of meat in my entire life, and I've never had an issue with testosterone. I've gotten blood tests, and all my levels are right where they need to be, and clearly I don't have any trouble building muscle. Studies comparing men who eat animal foods with men who don't have consistently demonstrated no difference in testosterone levels. I found this hard to believe, since plant-based diets often include soy products, which I'd always been told were loaded with estrogen. I post a lot of my food, and if it includes any type of soy products, out of 100 comments, you've got 20 to 30 of them saying, hey, well, I heard that soy raises estrogen levels. Well, that's not the case. Soy, it turns out, contains phytoestrogens, compounds that look like estrogens but can actually have the opposite effect, blocking some of our body's estrogen receptors and preventing real dietary sources of estrogen from taking hold. The foods that contain real estrogens are animal foods, like chicken, eggs, and dairy, which can have a significant impact on our hormone levels. Simply drinking cow's milk can increase a man's estrogen levels by 26%, in just one hour, while dropping their testosterone levels by 18%. Another hormone strongly connected to diet is cortisol, a stress hormone linked to reduced muscle mass and increased body fat. Research has shown that people who replace animal foods with high carbohydrate plant foods experience an average drop in cortisol levels of 27%. This is what I always heard, like, you can't go lean, you can't go shredded, vegan because you have so much carbs but I'm standing here in the best shape of my life easy I already knew that processed carbs like white flour and sugar can lead to weight gain but what I didn't realize is that unprocessed carbohydrates like oats bananas and sweet potatoes are associated with decreased body fat An eight-week weight training trial also found that those consuming a normal amount of carbs gained 2.9 pounds of muscle mass, while those in the low-carb group actually lost muscle. A typical bodybuilding diet is a very low-carb diet. So these guys that haven't had a carb in two weeks, they're walking around like zombies. I'm backstage eating all the carbs that I want. They're like, how are you eating that right now when you look this shredded? <laughs> 